what we're going to do is we're um, Phil's uh, worked on some uh, mega trends that you may have seen on a blog before. And we're just going to discuss those a little bit. And then we're going to get into a little bit of uh, a risk management report that we'd collaborated with on uh, with Google Cloud and, and what that means and, and maybe some actions you can take out of that. But I want to ask you, Phil, first on the, the trends, which um, hopefully you've got to memorize because we've got kind of a small screen here, yep. but it'll, it'll get a little bigger. But um, was was there a backstory on on how you came up with this, a process to do it, and how you came up with the eight mega trends? Yeah, so, so we, we were constantly asked, as you might expect, you know, and this is one of the best audiences to talk about this, is, is, is cloud more secure than on-premise? And, and of course, like, it'd be hard in, in my job not to say, like, absolutely yes. Um, but of course, the, the answer is a little bit more nuanced in the, in the fact that you can obviously misconfigure a secured cloud to leave yourself exposed. And you can actually spend a lot of time and effort securing an on-premise environment. But I think you know, this group more than most will realize that generally speaking, it's easier to get a more secured environment using up-to-date cloud services from a reputable cloud provider. And, and then you ask the next question, well, why is that? Is it, you know, is it because we invest a ton of money in, in security? Yes. You know, is it because we have some really great security engineers? Yes. But the real reason is actually when, when we sat back and thought, we almost can't help but keep increasing security in the cloud. And it's because of a bunch of what we called mega trends. And these are, you know, these, these are concepts in life in general, these unstoppable forces that even if you decide to push back against them, they're gonna come at you anyway. Or even if you decide you know, to ignore them, they're gonna be there. And so we kind of thought, what are the, what are the kind of the mega trends that drive cloud mm -hmm. security? And, you know, and, and the, these, these, are those, these are those mega trends. Yeah. Awesome. And Google, it's been recently, I think you've been thought of as a security thought leader, so I'm kind of interested in this, but the first one, economy of scale. I know when we started CSA in 2009, economics was a big thing people were talking about. So, so what did you mean by this? Well, so this one is classic. You know, this is pretty, you know, there's a reason this is number one, because kind of, I, I think sometimes as a security profession, we underestimate the power of economics. I mean, we, you know, some of the stuff Rich was just talking about, when you think about kind of the pervasiveness and the need to commoditize control so you can kind of raise the baseline by reducing the cost of control. So it's not all about deploying your most expensive controls against your most critical assets. It's about commoditizing the hell out of things so you can flood the entire environment with higher and higher security. And the classic example is the economics of cloud really help you do that. I mean, the scale of a, by definition, a hyperscale cloud provider, uh, and again, this is not just us. We, you know, we think we do pretty good at this, but I think the other hyperscalers have the same model. We can invest in some security technologies um, that are very expensive, but we can amortize it over this huge fleet of infrastructure that means it's kind of pennies at a time on individual servers or VMs. A classic example, you know, we, we built this technology we call the Titan security chip a number of years ago. That was a very expensive piece of silicon design and silicon implementation. It provides a cryptographic route of trust and a secure boot capability for all of our infrastructure. But the cost of that amortized over this huge fleet is, is, is minuscule and this enables us to do things like pervasive encryption, pervasive encryption at rest, communications, enables us to do secure boot and have a secure stack built on top of that. In my old role in an enterprise, you know, I could do a, some of that on-premise, but I certainly would never claim, and I don't think many enterprises could claim that in their on-premise environment, every server is a secure boot you know, with firmware validation and everything's encrypted. You just could never realistically afford to do that in, at scale. But in cloud, you just get that for free, and it's not necessarily just because the cloud providers care, although as you'll see with some of the other megatrends, there's a bit of that, but it's really because you can just invest and amortize that. And so cloud's this machine that commoditizes and drives down the cost of control so everybody can have higher and higher levels of control. Okay. So that makes total sense, that scale. Um, but we obviously all have responsibilities. And so the second one is about, but instead of shared responsibility, I thought it was interesting, shared fate. Yeah, so this is something, you know, again, having spent a lot of my time in, you know, kind of your seats in, uh, you know, in the enterprise consuming cloud technology, you know, one of the things I actually used to get 
you know, a little bit sick of, and I, I won't claim that Google was, was you know, free from sin in this respect, but I certainly spent a lot of time with all of the cloud providers as a, as a CISO, you know, essentially being lectured on the shared responsibility model that you, you all understand, you know, the cloud provider runs security for the cloud and you as a customer are responsible for configuring and, op configuring and operating securely in the cloud. You know, but when you get to the point where the cloud provider is lecturing you for the first 30 minutes of a one hour meeting about, don't you dare misconfigure my cloud because I don't want to look bad if you have a security incident. You start to think about is the shared responsibility model, you know, really shared responsibility. So we thought, you know, what we really want to express is this notion of shared fate, you know, which is like we're in this together. Now, you know, you could dismiss this as a bit of a marketing tagline and my friends in marketing use it that way. But really this drives a philosophy of what we do where it means we reach across that line of shared responsibility and try and put ourselves with more skin in the game with customers. And this could be better approaches to secure defaults, providing secure blueprints for people to use. And then the ultimate expression is, and I think we're still the only provider that does this, offering a cyber security insurance service in partnership with um, two big insurers, Allianz and Munich Re, to basically backstop the fact if you run with these configurations on the cloud, you're going to get cybersecurity insurance at a significant discount to market. And so there's this whole array of things, and, and, and it kind of resonates a lot. So every time, you know, if one of our customers has a security incident, and let's say it actually was their misconfiguration, we still feel that personally. I, you know, I, I run regular exercises where we look at these things and say, what could we have done differently? Could we have done default configuration better? Could we have provided better blueprints? Could we have provided better tooling? Could we have provided better training and advice to help customers avoid those things? So we, we, we take it very personally if a, if a customer has an issue, you know, even if it technically wasn't our fault on that line of shared responsibility. And, and I think that's, that's the expression of the shared fight. Okay. I, I love that. I think we should go to shared fate because things are so dynamic and a supply chain today could be very different in a company you just know a little bit, hey, they're a strategic partner the next day. And so we got to yep. think about it that way. So, okay, given that this sort of shared fate, we, we and, and we all, it's kumbaya, we, we come together. There's also this idea of like healthy competition. What, yep. what did you mean by that? Well, so this is, you know, and again, you know, I'm almost kind of preaching to the choir with this audience, but, you know, it's, it, I, you know, sadly, I've worked in kind of enterprises and technology for a, a long time. And I think this is the first time I've ever seen you've got, you know, three massive hyperscale client providers competing in quite brutal ways every single day to win business. And one of the main criteria for winning that business is security. Now, you know, you, and I think back when I was kind of working inside an enterprise, buying traditional enterprise software and enterprise hardware, you'd say to that traditional enterprise software company, I, I need you to do this security. And they'd go, yeah, we've not really heard that from any other customer. So we're going to have to like, you know, really kind of charge you for that. And then you talk to your counterparts as CISOs in other organizations and they say, yeah, we're asking them for the same thing. And the nice thing about cloud is there's this open dynamic where literally it's either requirement one or requirement two, but never lower than two. In every major deal, it's about security, it's about you know, reducing toil of compliance, it's resilience, it's reliability, it's privacy. And every single deal is contingent on that. And so all of our investments across the hyperscale cloud providers is about having better and better security, you know, less and less toil for compliance, increased resilience and reliability, and increased ease of use to make sure it can be operated securely. And that, that just cycles. I've never seen that happen before in kind of, you know, certainly most vendors historically have had to be dragged into that. Now cloud providers are competing on that and that's just so healthy for the industry. Mm -hmm. right. So I, I note it's been not very long ago that Microsoft released, and I'm forgetting one of their security solutions, I don't know if it's Defender or something for GCP or worked on their platform. Is that like, is that part of this, this co-opetition? Well, well, it's, it's interesting. So, you know, we, we've, we, place a lot of value in kind of multi-cloud mm -hmm. and, you know, hybrid multi-cloud and meeting customers where they are. You know, so sometimes, you know, people could cynically say that's because we're, you know, we, we, we were later to the market and we're playing catch up. But the reality is, we, you know, we encounter most customers 
have at least two, if not three, clouds, and there's various reasons for that. Sometimes it's competition, sometimes it's kind of inheritance. But generally speaking, a lot of our future cloud provider success is providing tooling and capability, recognizing that we're in a multi-cloud, multi-SaaS, hybrid on-premise environment right. with the cloud. And if you don't provide a set of capabilities for that, then you're not going to be as relevant in the future. Yep, yep, that's what we hear from our customers. So cloud as the digital immune system, that's again yeah. an interesting concept. So this is, you know, and it's funny, this is the reason ultimately I decided to come to a cloud provider, which is, you know, one of the things, and again, I think you all witnessed this, every month we push hundreds of security updates. I mean, it could be new features, new controls, new features embedded in product, it could be new security products, it could be you know, large amounts of kind of vulnerability fixes that each of the cloud provider pushes out and those vulnerabilities come from um, having been recognized by our own review teams, our own threat research, vulnerability research, penetration testing, red teams. And so what happens is you're pushing out all of these security updates. And so for most organizations, you can just sit back and take every update the provider's giving you, and you're just going to get an increasing level of security without much effort other than sitting back and you know maybe doing the change management of taking the update. But you know one of the things we see, and again, this is the first time I've really seen that there's this truly global dynamic where, for example, us watching some emerging threat that we've detected through some issue in billions of our endpoints running Chrome or some other solution, we can see a new emerging attack trend. We can then pre-arm all of the other capabilities to get ahead of that, implement that control before those particular attackers come to the rest of the environment. And that's almost like the definition of an immune system. And so again, I think the benefits of us wiring the planet through cloud and having this constant feedback loop to be able to detect and respond to threats and engineer mitigation, not just to specific threats, but to whole classes of attacks is, again, this healthy environment. I mean, again, you look back at some of the things a few years ago with things like you know, Spectre and Meltdown and some of the other really quite difficult um, you know, risks to mitigate a lot of the cloud providers were able to do that quite effectively in a way that you just couldn't necessarily always do in an on-premise environment. And we see that we see that every single day. And so I think, you know, the more we think about this as an immune system, the more we should be prepared to take updates. And the, this is again a driver of kind of intelligence and threat sharing and other things that keep that that OODA loop going faster and mm -hmm. faster and faster of how we respond to these things. Wait, what that as a concept makes total sense. Do you, do you have like statistics around this as internally that you actually see this playing out in that way as you grow? Yeah, I, I mean, so we've, we've nothing that we've kind of kind of published, although it's an interesting idea, that, but we, we definitely see um, that many attacks we observe and the threat intelligence we publish out of our threat analysis group and then also with now now we have our, our Mandiant group which you know obviously publishes a lot of threat intelligence we're able to see how quickly we can get mitigations out and how quickly customers take up those mitigations and as a result how many issues are avoided and and it and it's it's yep. it's, you know, it's it's remarkable in fact you know just how effective it becomes cool so um, this one's software-defined infrastructure. I think, like, I have my understanding of this, but definitely love to hear, like, how this one yeah. made it. Well, this is, and this is ultimately, and again, it's kind of resonant to what Rich was just talking about around continuous controls validation and assurance. The wonderful thing about cloud, and it's not just cloud, clearly you can run an on-premise like cloud environment where you're running it as a software-defined infrastructure. But again, as you all know, the great thing about cloud is it's you declaratively specify what you want your configuration to be. You're not surprised by configurations typically because somebody's installed a server in the data center in the wrong way or pushed an OS image in the wrong way. You're declaratively specifying your environment. And then you can do two things with that. One, you can analyze um, before you deploy whether that particular configuration meets your policy or your control goals. And then 
post deployment, you can continuously scan to be able to compare the deployed reality versus the expected configuration. And again, Rich touched on this, is, is most security breaches that I think occur, there's some exceptions, but the vast majority are not where it's a genuinely new form of attack that's going through existing controls. It's going to a place where the controls you thought you had were no longer deployed for whatever reason. And so a software-defined infrastructure is not just great for expressing policy intent, it's also great for continuous monitoring. And the most important thing organizations have to do is continuous control monitoring to make sure the controls that you think you have are actually present when you need them. And that's mm -hmm. ultimately enabled just so much more easily with software-defined right. infrastructure. And it seems like it's a key enabler to actually getting the economies of scale that you can make everything software-defined infrastructure as code. Yep, that, exactly. All right, so, uh, and again, probably related, increasing deployment and velocity. I mean, what do you mean by this and how critical is this? Yes, yeah, yeah, so, so our scale, we have to continuously integrate and deploy and push code. And deployment velocity is not just a, a competitive thing for us, it's a necessary thing because we're always having to push upgrades. You know, when you run a global environment, it, there's always things that need upgrading, that need fixing, that need adjusting, and you therefore have to do this continuously. The reason this is a really important mega trend for everybody is because that's how the clouds run internally, we can't help but making all of our products have the character to be able to support continuous deployment and continuous integration and increased velocity. And the great thing about that is when you consume those products, your development teams are almost pushed into that continuous cycle, which is great for the security teams because it means you have more agility to do upgrades. It means you can actually take more operating risk to push security because you know you can roll back if you if you if you make a you know a configuration a configuration change that that creates some operating risk. So this kind of deployment velocity of how we run kind of almost like leaks into all the products that mm -hmm. you consume that mm -hmm. makes you have increased deployment velocity, which so so this is one of the more subtle ones, mm -hmm. but it's definitely mm -hmm. something we see as a we see as a benefit. Yeah, I, I know there's a lot of people been out there for quite a while that still they're having as fast as things move and, and the automation is great, but just I think there's a cultural thing with it. Some people are still have problems with this. Yep. So um, yeah, we, last year we had Mark Rosinovich, CTO of Azure, up here, and he, like, he sort of said, hey, Cloud's just a bunch of APIs. So it, it is kind of simple. So what did, you, what did you mean by simplicity here? Well, well so it's funny. Like, this is the one we get most pushback on. So anybody that's ever sat down at like the GCP console or the AWS console or the Azure console or whatever other cloud console, the first thing you think is like not like, wow, this is really simple. You know, and, and, but the, the reality is, is you know, it, the challenge in enterprise IT is very few people see the complexity of enterprise IT because you have storage engineers, sysadmins, DevOps, developers, security, network engineers. You, you have a whole array of roles that are in these bifurcated silos and nobody ever really saw the total complexity. But when you come to the cloud, because it is all software defined, you get that single integrated view. Now, it's a lot less complex than the traditional enterprise IT environment. But because you're seeing that initial complexity, the great thing about that is cloud then becomes this kind of abstraction generating machine because people say, wow, this is way more complex than I can deal with. And we go, okay. And then we introduce mm -hmm. abstractions. Mm -hmm. And that perpetual abstraction creates not just more simplicity, but more embedded and default security. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example. So. Kubernetes, so Google Kubernetes engine. Um, you know, it's you know Kubernetes in general has a little bit of a reputation for complexity, mm -hmm. um, which I think is is a bit misguided. So anybody that's ever worked in enterprise IT and has built uh, or tried to assemble a distributed system out of multiple different databases, transaction brokers clustering systems, scheduling systems, and try to connect that together and run at global scale with multiple different vendors, you can barely keep that running, and that's complex. Whereas you come to Kubernetes, and it's way simpler than that. But it's okay, Kubernetes can be perceived as being complex. And, and so we took that feedback, we built this thing called GKE Autopilot, 
which is an abstraction layer that for people that don't want to get under the hood and fine tune Kubernetes, you get very easy and simple configuration. We're actually going even further with that now with some of the stuff we build on top of that that makes it even easier. And again, you can open up the HUD and go down and configure things, but most people don't want to do that. And the reason is, because people perceive things as complex, we're going to keep driving these abstractions. Mm -hmm. And that benefits security, because the abstractions contain security by default. That right. Perpetual abstraction, that's actually quite an interesting concept. I mean, and that can represent, if you don't like it, if it's too complex, then you just simplify it yourself. You have the tools yep. for that. Maybe it's even a business opportunity. Yep, no, exactly. So, um, okay, so the last one here, and I three months ago I was at Deutsche Telekom in Bonn and they gave me a, sort of a, a briefing on the, the Google Sovereign Cloud project they're doing there. So I was wondering if this was sort of part of that, what, what you're thinking about, but yeah. sovereignty meets sustainability. Yeah, so, so sovereignty is an interesting one. You know, around the world, many countries have or are introducing data localization laws where they require certain types of their national data and certain parts of their critical infrastructure to be housed in data centers or infrastructure in country. Now the interesting thing again when you look back at the past 20 years of enterprise IT what most large companies have been doing is they've been pulling out local data centers in country and consolidating them into massive regional data centers or small numbers of global data centers and so now when faced you know, many industries when faced with having to put back data in country, they don't want to rebuild like the old data centers. So in fact, because of clouds, scale and geographic dispersion, they're able to see cloud as a means of re-implementing sovereignty, in other words, national control over data. And because of the controls the cloud providers have built in around data residency, assured workloads, the uh, management of cryptographic keys locally, the ability for customers to manage and handle cryptographic keys is, is, is ultimately a, an, an ability to meet that. Now, you know, what you're talking about, the, the work we're doing, we have this thing called Trusted Partner Cloud, which is for certain EU countries, particularly France and Germany at the moment. So the partnership we have with Deutsche Telekom in Germany, essentially what we do is we create a, an, an isolated, it's not, it's not kind of a, a disconnected cloud, it's like a Google Cloud region and set of zones for which a trusted local partner, in this case Deutsche Telekom, uh, manage the privileged access and cryptographic keys so that even if we wanted to go in that environment and pull the data, we couldn't because a local IT provider has the keys and so any request for data would have to come to that local IT provider which is subject to national laws, not US laws. Mm -hmm. And so we, we've been quite committed to the notion that sovereign clouds should respect national sovereignty but there shouldn't be a second class cloud with three year out of date features in a kind right. of an isolated environment where that never gets an update. So we think we've kind of hit the best of both worlds. And then on the sustainability piece, I almost kind of throw that in as a, a side effect, but it's, it's interesting. Global distribution of cloud enables you to pick the energy profiles you want because we're able to put data centers in different places with different power generation requirements. And so one of the things that's, that's nice is you get to be able to see your workloads and see your carbon footprint of those workloads and then decide, given the flexibility of the geographic dispersion, that you might want to put that in a, uh, a more carbon friendly data center that's mm -hmm. wind powered or solar powered. And, uh, and I think the sovereignty and sustainability coupled with this geographic distribution give mm -hmm. people a lot, of, a lot of controls. And again, it's not something, anything other than maybe the largest 10 companies in the world can even mm -hmm. contemplate, right. but even they can't contemplate the economics of doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, that, that makes perfect sense. It seems as though it's gonna be an interesting journey to like from an administrative perspective, kind of what you learn out of this as you move forward with this, yep. but we'll be very interested to track it. So um, a little bit off script, but I'd gotten a few um, people have asked me when they saw you were gonna speak is kind of understanding strategically about um, the Mandiant and, and that decision there. Because there's people surprised like, you know, obviously Mandiant has 
has technology, but they also have a lot of really smart people. And, and kind of is that part of what you think about this competition and um, hyperscalers becoming thought leaders? Is that going to be more typical and kind of what, what the thought is about that? Yeah, well, so, so I think, you know, we, we've slowly but surely, you know, so, so our strategy is what we describe as security built in, not bolted on. And so, you know, our goal is to build security into all of the platforms and products that we operate. Um, but additionally, we've been growing slowly but surely quite a comprehensive security business, whether it's things like Chronicle, we've done some other acquisitions like C Amplify, which is a very good source solution. We've clearly, you know, we've got things like Virus Total, which is the world's biggest database of, of, of malware, uh, and, and a number of other solutions. And when we looked at the market, the, as we think about how do we become a, a full spectrum security provider in a multi-cloud hybrid on-premise world, it, you, you need something like a Mandiant, which is the, the forensic tooling some of the attack surface discovery, some of the managed services, plus all of the professional services and the incident response and the mm -hmm. leading threat intelligence capability. And so it kind of fit in really nicely. And in fact, you know, I've, I, you know, we've, you know, we've known Mandy and I've known Kevin for 20 years. And so, you know, their, their people and the culture is very compatible with our environment. And they kind of welcomed the acquisition because they're able to slot into us uh, you know, they're not going to get unpicked. They're a self-contained business. You know, we're taking some of the products and aligning it with Chronicle and VT and C Amplify to create this much, uh, you know, m you know, much more significant set of security um, services and products. Um, but the vast majority of the Mandiant business is is going to remain intact and, in fact, grow as an incident response and professional services mm -hmm. business. Um, the thing as well, what you know, we've we as Google, we've already got a huge amount of amazing threat intelligence. Many of you will be familiar with our threat analysis group um, that's been the leading threat intelligence provider for a long time. Uh, and then we also have in cloud this, uh, you know, a cloud threat intelligence group that specializes in the intersection of that with cloud. Um, and then now having Mandiant threat intelligence that's based on kind of incidents as opposed to broad internet wide data collection. I think in the end of this, we, you know, we'll, we'll have probably the biggest and most effective set of threat intelligence. And the strategy is to take all of that and drive that as fuel into products so that not only are we driving that digital immune system we talked about, but it'll be kind of IOCs that automatically feed up into mm -hmm. Chronicle um, and other things. And again, just intrinsically, so as you buy a product, it should just be pre-enabled with threat intelligence fuel mm -hmm. provided from the environment. And you know that Mandiant is like the perfect mm -hmm. slot in for right. that. Just it seems like you are going to be able to get like the cream of the crop in terms of security professionals that want to come work for you. Yep. And so some people might go, oh, that's not fair. I mean, would your position be that that actually supports the whole economies, the economy at scale, that yep. you can take that expertise and you can get more value out of it? No, no, that's exactly right. I mean, in, you know, my old my old role as a CISO of a, of a very large bank, we didn't have the economy of scale to have that. I, you know, I had some pretty good threat intelligence analysts. In fact, you know, the, like world, some world-class people, but they were like 10 to 15 people. Mm -hmm. you know, and there's only so much that many people can do. And you then think, what do I need to have a full threat intelligence capability? You need about 100, 100, 200 people. Like now, as, even as a very large global bank, you just don't have enough Mm -hmm. of interesting things to do yep. to keep 200 people occupied and skilled and exercised. And so therefore, economy of scale is just so important. I mean, I, I'm kind of I'm a computer scientist by back background, not an economist, but the biggest things I've learned over the past two decades is it, or everything comes down to economics yep. and incentives. Yep. And if you, if you don't get the flywheels lined up and you don't get the economy of scale and resources, that it just thing, things just grind mm -hmm. to a halt. Yep. And, and again, more as cloud gets more and more scaled up, it's just the flywheel of the economy of scale is is just gets bigger and bigger. Um, now, at some point, you know, you, we can talk about kind of, you know, the the long term concentration risk mm -hmm. of that. And there's a, you know, perhaps mm -hmm. the ninth mega trend we've yet to write is mm -hmm. is how we deal and think about open standards, open source mm -hmm. workload and data portability to be able to create the right amount of portability to mitigate yep. concentration risk. And that's something where, you know, we want to drive the industry. We've been, I think you've all seen us been very committed to open standards and open source. And I think, 
Everybody that's customers of cloud should pound the table if you ever see a cloud provider doing things to open source, to you know, make it open source in name only, but proprietary on the insides because, you know, and if, you know, call me out if you ever see us doing that because we strive to not do that. We see some other providers do that and I think it goes against the desire for portability yep. and open standards. Yep. So it's, it's totally my fault. I went off script a little bit, but we're going to have to just hit a couple um, points here. So, so Google and, and CSA, we uh, actually collaborate on a survey and analysis called Measure Risk and Risk Governance. And we're going to make sure you have all the slides. You can go download it. Encourage you to read the report. But there was, there's, there was four key findings. But I want to go to the second one to get your comments on, on this. You know, we found that this, this challenge with risk evaluation is that organizations were, a majority were uh, a year or longer in terms of, of um, modifying their risk metrics based on what they saw. And over half after their initial assessment of a provider weren't like reauthorizing them, looking at them. So thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we see organizations make two mistakes on how they think about risk managing cloud adoption. You know, the, the, the first is they do their risk assessments based on specific workload migration or specific data set migration. And, and as a result, the migrations are quite slow. And it's, sometimes it's not actually the security team. Sometimes it's the compliance teams, the legal teams, the audit teams. Sometimes it's even, you know, we've seen some organizations where the board get involved in approving things. And, and we work with those organizations to then instead put in place, if you like, the, the rails by which, you know, if you approve a certain set of configurations for a certain class of workloads and a certain class of data, you're setting up the risk assessment and classification processes for those generic constructs and therefore specific workloads and specific data that falls within those established patterns mm -hmm. can just kind of flow into the environment. And I think shifting the risk assessment to be about categories and configurations as opposed to specifics is, is where we see a lot of success. The, the other thing as well, and I almost hesitate to say this because it'll sound like a bit whiny, is one of the things we see is organizations do appropriate architectural validation of the big cloud providers. And, you know, this is almost, you know, these architectural colonoscopies are, are like, you know, <laughs> we welcome them. We welcome the inquisition because it continues to make us better. But there's a bunch of SaaS providers out there that where there's like, that the, they have a lot of data from major enterprises and they've gone through these fairly lightweight vendor assessments mm -hmm. because they're a SaaS provider, not a cloud provider. And, you know, again, I'm not going to name names, but there's a few SaaS providers out there that really have got, you know, some reasonably good answers to the standard 20 question control assessments. But when you go digging under the hood and look at the actual controls and the tenancy separation and the controls that would stop an engineer getting to customer data, they're really not great. And so one of the things I think we also have to look at is how do we make sure that the same degree of rigor that organizations apply to the review of the cloud providers, which again, I can't stress enough, we welcome, it's appropriate, but that's also gonna be applied to these SaaS providers that contain yep. just as much critical data. Right. Yep, that was what I was mentioning backstage. That's a huge pain point. Financial services are coming to us yep. wanting to address that side. So read the report. That's some good input for us for the second version of the report. We really appreciate, Phil, I know you took some personal time in analyzing that, so it just behooves all of you to go go look at that. So just really appreciate it. Phil Venables, iconic CISO, Teddy Roosevelt fan, who knew, <laughs> it was just a pleasure having him. Give it up for, for Phil Venables. Thanks.